On behalf of the Norwegian Philosophy Festival of Kragerø, the Norwegian Humanist Association and the French Institute, I would like to welcome, welcome you all to this discussion between Pascal Bruckner and Thomas Willem Eriksen. One of the most important questions uh, of our time is the nature of European identity. What is it? Is it democracy, human rights, art and philosophy? Or is it the Holocaust, colonialism and damage of the environment? Is modern Europe founded on Christianity? or on the values of the Enlightenment. So, what role should our cultural roots play in our multicultural societies of today? What should be the European identity of tomorrow? One of the most interesting voices in this important deba debate is Pascal Bruckner. Bruckner is one of the most significant current French philosophers and has written several books about what we are going to discuss tonight. One of his main arguments is that our focus on the faults of European culture makes us blind to its merits. This is especially dangerous in a time when the best European values democracy, human rights, and secularism is needed more than ever. His partner in this discussion will be a very well-known social anthropologist, uh, Thomas Hillan Eriksen. For many years, he's had cultural and multicultural identity as one of his main research interests. Bruckner and uh, Hillan Eriksen will speak for about um, 45 minutes. Then we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. And we'll aim at finishing at half past seven. Welcome to both of you, especially to Bruckner, who has come all the way from Paris. Thanks very much, Kaya, and, uh, and thanks for, for doing this, for organising this conversation. And I must say, I'm both uh, humbled and, uh, and flattered to get this opportunity to, uh, to discuss uh, important issues with uh, Pascal Bruckner, I mean, whom I ha hadn't met until uh, this weekend. We were in Kragerö together, and he gave a wonderful lecture there on, uh, on love and marriage. Um, I don't think we're going to talk about love and marriage today, but rather on... Uh, well, not entirely unrelated issues, I guess, because there is something European about the way we think about love and marriage, but about uh, uh, our identity, who we are, what is Europe, what is Europe going to be, and obviously what we're talking about are the challenges of, of globalization, to begin with a very big word. Um, the challenges arising from uh, increased contact, increased mobility, increased frictions, but also increased uh, learning from others and enrichment and also increased, I guess, uh, conflict in some areas uh, because of the, uh, the fact that, I mean, for, for a long time, uh, the discrete societies were, were pretty isolated, so they could uh, more or less go on uh, with their own business as the way, the way they liked. Uh, at least uh, influences came slowly. And nowadays, we, uh, we're all exposed to each other. We're all contemporaries. Everything is happening at the same time. Uh, so uh, we're all part of the same global ecumeny, you might say. And uh, what we're going to talk about, I guess, is to do with, uh, uh, with the role of Europe and the identity <coughs> of Europeans in this uh, new uh, situation. And we're probably going to talk about multiculturalism, but let me, let me begin by another question, because, uh, Pascal Brickner, you've, uh, you've been writing about these things for a number of years. I mean, already in the early 1980s, you wrote a book about the expiation of the self contempt of the white man, as it were, in the face of uh, le tiers-mondisme, the uh, third world-based ideology, according to which, uh, well, to put it bluntly, everything here was bad and everything there was good, in a sense. Uh, and uh, and you, uh, then you, you called for a stronger confidence in the European heritage and a, and a stronger belief in what Europe has produced. Now, more recently, 
you've written about similar topics, but, but from, a, from a very different perspective, because now suddenly you no longer have the spectrum of communism, but you have the spectrum of Islamism. Um, we, we no longer live in a bipolar world, but in a more multipolar world, which is a bit more confusing, more complex, in, in both political and cultural uh, terms. And of course, we live in a post, I guess, 9-11 world in, 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 in some ways. Um, some European intellectuals would argue that there is too little self-criticism in Europe. We are too confident. We should listen more to others. We should democratize uh, more the sort of the uh, uh, right of property, property rights to ideas and so on. And we should monopolize the Enlightenment and try to, you know, say that these values are universal and they belong to everybody. Whereas others, and here I think it's correct to include you, feel that there has been too much self-criticism and too little confidence. Could you elaborate a little bit on this, on your position here? Oh, this is not going to be an interview, I just wanted to start with no, no. the question. <laughs> the first question is very difficult. Um, you, you mentioned the third wordism, I think. Third wordism had as an ambition to succeed to uh, communism which had failed. And the idea was that uh, those new independent countries in the south, which had just been decolonized, uh, were uh, uh, bearing the future of uh, humankind and that uh, Europe had globally failed and that uh, the future of humanity was beyond our, uh, the ocean and in, in the south of, uh, of uh, in, in Africa and in Middle East and in Asia, but no, not anymore in, in Western Europe, whose failure was obvious. And then in, in its turn, Third Worldism failed. It failed in, in Vietnam, it failed in Cambodia, it failed in many African countries where socialism, socialism had tried to implant itself, in South America also. But um, the spirit of self-criticism of Europe has not ceased since then. And uh, in some ways, and especially in a country like France, sometimes it, it turns into uh, <coughs> mimicry, a caricature, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, it tends to be uh, ludicrous. Mm. And so what I, try to, to, what I try to do for the last 20 years is to re-establish an equilibrium between the, the, the necessity to be uh, self-critical and to, uh, to see your society as it is, but not to be so critical as it turns into a calumny. And uh, many Europeans, Europeans, especially on the left, tend to draw a, a picture of their own culture which doesn't look like what we live every day. It is so dark, it is so, um, it is so uh, manichaic that uh, you, you don't exactly recognize the world in which you live. Yes. And um, so there is one new fact which has happened since December 2010 and which is going on in this year, which is so rich in many diverse events, is the Arab riots, mm -hmm. which no one ever expected. So maybe uh, the Arab world is extremely far from uh, Norway. Uh, and France is <coughs> intertwined with North Africa, at least, and with uh, part of uh, the Middle East. So, you know, what happens in Tunisia, in, in, in Algeria, in Morocco, or in Egypt is, uh, has an echo, as an echo in Paris and in every uh, French city. Uh, as we have, uh, part of the French identity today is Arabic. Yes. Whether we like it or not, this is a fact, as it is also African. So uh, this is part of our colonial inheritance. And so we live together, as you said uh, at the beginning, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a global ecumeny, so, uh, and community at least. And so nobody expected what was happening in the Arab world. We saw that these, uh, those Arab countries were doomed to tyranny, whether to fall into uh, religious fanaticism or to fall into uh, autocr autocracy. And suddenly, the Arabs themselves, and it started in, tu in Tunisia, uh, show to the world that they were aspiring to something different, yes. which was the, the fight for human rights, the fight for dignity, and the fight for some kind of pluralism. Yes. 
some kind of democracy. And so without knowing it, Europe slowly and by, by a kind of ca capillarity has infected, uh, I cannot say it differently, all those countries with this democratic ideal. So the, uh, we have to recognize that this is also the success of enlightened values, which are claimed today by many demonstrators in, in Egypt, in Libya, of course, in Tunisia. And this is, uh, in a way, so maybe someone doesn't agree with me. <laughs> I will answer the question later. <laughs> So, so, you know, at the very moment where, when Europe is, is, is uh, plunged into a doubt about itself, European values are resurrecting uh, 2,000 kilometers from our own coast. So it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And, uh, of course, Europe is tired. I know in this country you don't like us very much because you want to stay outside of Europe. And maybe you're right on your point of view. If I were Norwegian, I would probably not join the EU for, for many reasons, uh, many economic reasons. But uh, whether you like it or not, you belong to Europe. And uh, uh, it's true that uh, Europe is, is a tired continent. Yes, yes. It's, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I find a lot in your reasoning to with which to agree, and also in your book, I mean, uh, Tyranny de la Penitence, The Tyranny of Guilt, which was published in English, I think, last year. And in, in, uh, in, in Norwegian. Norwegian. In Norwegian. Yes. Norwegian. And in Norwegian, yeah. yeah. Um, what's it called in Norwegian? Botfærdighetens Tyranny. Botfærdighetens Tyranny. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Highly recommended. And, and you make a number of, I mean, very acute observations, I think, such as, the Algerians, or certain large segments of the Algerian population wanted the French out. But the moment they managed to chase them out, they went to France, they started to go to France. And it reminds me of something Frederick Barth once said, who's a, who's a very famous Norwegian anthropologist and also specialist on you know, the northwestern part of Pakistan and the border areas towards Afghanistan, where he says, and he wrote a book about the Taliban some years ago, where he says that, you know, um, of course the Afghans hate America, but everybody wants to go there. Now the question is, do they want to go there in order to become more like us, or do they want to come here in order to transform our societies? This is a big debate in France also, about uh, immigrants, especially from North Africa, and, and you know, people who move in faith and so on. What do you think? Yeah, so what you said just reminds me of a line which was written in, uh, somewhere on, on the wall in uh, I think in Paris, it's a young kids go home, but take me with you. Which is true. But I would say that today, uh, well, maybe we have the time to speak later about the differences between the United States and Europe. Yes. And, and, and the more times, uh, and there are many differences in, in, in this uh, respect, but uh, the question you ask, do they want to come over to Europe? <clears throat> to convert us to uh, radical Islam, or, or why, why, do they come, uh, why do they want to come over to Europe or to the United States? And I think maybe we should uh, uh, put ourselves in the mind of the migrants. Why does a, a, a man or a family decide to migrate to Sweden, to Norway, to France, or to the United States? And I think there is a uh, I think uh, there is one very uh, simple answer which has been termed by Francis Bacon in the 16th century when he was speaking about what is the goal of science. And he said, if I recall correctly, he said, improvement of man's estate. He said the, the, the goal of science was to improve uh, the, uh, every man's condition. You know, better health, better housing, uh, more money, uh, more security. And I think uh, every person that migrates from one place to another place has exactly this kind of idea. If Africans want to come over to Europe, when Norwegians left Norway to go to the United States in the 19th century, it's exactly for the same reason. It's a kind of calculation, you know, you know what you leave, yeah. you, 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 and you, you, you're going to go through a lot of perils, you're gonna go, you, you can die, and many people die, you know, 
these days, yeah. when they try to go from Libya to Lampedusa in Italy, mm -hmm. to try to flee the war, yeah. the civil war, and to try to, to get uh, better life conditions, yeah. you, you, you're going to be submitted to some kind of racism, <coughs> you're discriminated, you're going to have to work, uh, uh, you're going to take jobs which are not good jobs, but at the end, your expectation is that your life will be better yes. in this part of the world rather than in the village where you come from. Absolutely, and in many cases they're even able to support family members. In yeah, their, they have in to their support their family members. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, part, it's often part of the deal. And one could also mention migrants from Mexico across to the American, to, to the United States. So yes, I, 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 I think you're right. But um, let's return to the question of the Europeanness, because uh, I, I share with you the conviction that one of the things that is unique about Europe is the pluralism. The fact that historically, uh, at the onset of modernity, it, it, comparisons have been made between China and Europe. And the question has been raised now and then, why did China not become Europe? Why did China not become the engine? the big colonizing power uh, of the world. And why, why did those puny European countries, which just a couple of hundred years earlier were so disorganized, it was unbelievable, and, and where the, uh, the, the caliphate stretched way up into Spain and so on, why did it become Europe? And, and one common explanation is that, well, uh, China was a, what, what Marx would call an oriental, uh, you know, oriental despotism. I mean, you had uh, the hydraulic society where it was extremely centralized and there was little room, as it were, for the development of critical thought. Um, and so the emperor could just decide that we no longer want, no longer want contact with barbarians because it's going to destroy us, you know, our culture and our, our, our souls and so on. And this happened in, around the 14th century. Whereas in Europe you had this competition between small countries, which meant that everybody really had to exceed themselves in order to compete, you know, between the Dutch and the English, the French, uh, the Spanish and, uh, and so on. Uh, but what is the, uh, the role of this pluralism today in the face of migrants? You, you think? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that there is a there is an incipient secularism and cosmopolitan in the history of Europe, and with the legacy of the the religious wars, for example, what we've learned from those, um, that maybe in the future, let's find something else than religion, you know, to fight wars about. Um, isn't there something here that could easily accommodate uh, immigrants and make them feel at home there? Because we have a tradition of pluralism in Europe. Yes. Unlike, it, unlike in many other parts of the world. Yeah. Well, I, I would give two answers to you, to what you just said. The, the roots of uh, Europe criticism uh, it comes from Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Christian religion has invented something which, uh, to my knowledge, does not exist somewhere else. It's self-examination. I mean, when you, you're young, you're being uh, uh, taught by catechism, you have to uh, look into yourself to make the account of your own sins, uh, your, your failures, and in Catholicism, or the tradition I, where I come from, you have to confess yourself, which is a very uh, perverse also mechanism because most of the time when you're a child, you invent sins in order to have something to say to the priest. And by inventing sins, of course, you have to go deep into yourself and to, to take up the roots of your uh, uh, eventual perversity. Yes. So, uh, but this tradition of self-examination, uh, little by little, has uh, developed itself in, until the Enlightenment times and has allowed um, the, the European mind to uh, look at itself in contradictory ways. And during its history, Europe has invented many phenomena which explain its taste for pluralism, mm -hmm. for its uh, reform. Uh, the, yes. the Protestant reform has had a huge impact on, on Europe and has probably saved Europe from, uh, uh, from fanaticism mm -hmm. exhausted by Rome. And then the Renaissance yeah. and then the Enlightenment. And, oh, and in which concern the religious traditions? We do not have in France the same uh, history as you have here because what we have is the memory of the civil religious wars. Mm -hmm. My own family is divided between Protestants and Catholics, mm -hmm. and those uh, religious civil wars have been absolutely terrible. Yeah. Genocides, massacres, mm -hmm. and for instance, just one small example. Um, in the south of France, every end of August, the Protestants celebrate the, the um, a massacre made by the Camisards, which were the soldiers of Louis XV, 
against the Protestants, where they have uh, raised the whole region from uh, their Protestants. And it's still, you know, it's still a wound which exists and which people commemorate every year. And, and so, from those uh, religious wars, the French have learned that there is nothing more dangerous than the exercise of one religion. And so there is a, a famous sentence by Voltaire, which was said, when there is one, one religion, there is only one religion, it's tyranny. When you have two religions, you have civil wars. When you have many religions, it's democracy. And that, that's what happened in, uh, in America. Because if the American democracy is so at ease with religion, it's because religion came to the United States in numbers. You have the Baptists, yes. you have uh, yeah. the Lutheran, you have all those yeah. religions. And um, uh, yeah. so the Americans have, have uh, an, an habit of uh, religious uh, pluralism. Yes, and which also, I mean, what were you saying about the patterns of migration to, to America? I mean, I think I'd like to make two points about this, because one of them is that, um, yes, one, one may write the history of Europe in terms of pluralism, as I, as I just tentatively did, but one may also write it in terms of religious persecution. So, so I mean, many of the people who, who eventually populated uh, North America and drove the Indians out, uh, were were religious uh, fanatics from Europe. I mean, Huguenots from France and uh, and low Christian Protestants from from all over the place who finally were free to practice their fundamentalism. And this also goes a long way, I think, to explain why Americans. I mean, the proportion of Americans who believe in Darwin is slightly lower than the proportion of Turks, you know, who believe in Darwin. Okay. So the the, the role of religion and Christianity. When Obama was elected, there was a big discussion about what churches should go to, and they had to find the sort of a credible church, not too Afri African American nationalist, but you know it should still have street credibility among African Americans as well. Whereas when we get a new prime minister, nobody cares. I mean, he, whether he goes to church or not, it's just not a matter of you know public interest. So that's what that's one that's one thing. And another thing is that um, you, you speak about uh, you know pluralism, secularism, and and so on, and the fact of having several religions, and which is a pretty good idea as opposed to having just one. And in France, what that what that solved is simply by banishing religion from the from the public sphere. So so that's a republican tradition, which is shared by Kemalism in Turkey and by some other countries, which which is you know uh, a very it was an extremely radical take on the problem of politics and religion at the time in the in the late 18th century, incredibly uh, radical. Whereas at the same time. Um, we have, a, we have a situation where it is not obvious that difference is okay with Europeans. You know, in this country, in Norway and Denmark, we just have one word, okay, for similarity and equality, similarity and equality. We have one word, liket, which means both. So in other words, in order to be equal, first you have to become similar. And they're conflated. We don't distinguish it between them, even in, our, even in our language. It's just that one word. So difference is a problem. Whereas in some non-European countries, if we could just move the gaze slightly away from Europe and see if other, other civilizations have also something to contribute. Uh, in India, there's a very long tradition of secularism, uh, which goes along pretty much the same lines as you speak of with regards to, to France. That, uh, of course, people should have their religion. But nobody should be able to dictate which one, and that's you know to them is is uh, is uh, secularism, and uh, faced with uh, some of the excesses of uh, of uh, colonial rule, um, Mahatma Gandhi once was asked famously, you know, um, what do you think of Western civilization, and he replies, well, I think that would be a pretty good idea. <laughs> so so in other words, uh, isn't there a danger in your position? that it, it will just create a deeper gulf, as it were, between us and the others. Because nobody wants to build their democracy on borrowed ideas. Everybody <coughs> wants to build their democracy. In this country, historians have gone to great lengths to show that democracy was really invented by Norwegians. <laughs> you know, it's not an import. Yes, and, uh, and this should happen in North Africa too, don't you think? The no, Ottoman Empire and its pluralism. No, I think this will happen anyway. Any, uh, uh, you took the example of India. The Indians have adopted as a parliamentary uh, English democracy, mm -hmm. but they have reshaped it in their own way. Yeah. And India has remained a democracy for the last 50 years, in spite of all the setbacks, in, in spite of the tension. Yeah, it's remarkable. In, in spite of uh, the pogroms made by the Hindus against the Muslim and by the Muslim against the Hindus, in spite of the wars with Pakistan. And that's why probably India has more chance to develop itself in a better way than China. Because democracy allows the country to correct itself, 
to fight corruption, to fight fanaticism. So that's why my, 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 my expectations are greater for India than they are for China. And I, I have to say that I love India on the, on, on, on the other side. So, so it's, a, it's a very partial view. But, uh, so your question, not your question, but you were, maybe you could go back f five minutes to religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the, the, the French tradition of secularism is quite different from the one in the Anglo-Saxon world. Absolutely. How did we turn secular? By a very violent struggle which lasted for three centuries against the church, the Catholic Church. Catholic Church exercised a terrible power on, uh, on the people. Mm -hmm. uh, just Let me just remi uh, remind you one, one fact. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 18th century, a man in Toulouse has been beheaded because he refused to take off his hat when an uh, archbishop was passing in the street. Mm -hmm. And he was accused to be a Protestant, and then he was uh, tortured, and uh, if, if, any, if any was sentenced to death. And, uh, the, the French Revolution is a very violent reaction against the Catholic Church. We hang priests, mm -hmm. we destroy churches, and the same thing happened in Mexico, uh, yes. I, uh, before I think before World War II, yes. where thousands of Catholic priests have been uh, beheaded, killed, shot, and Graham Greene made yeah, yeah, a, a, wonderful novel. a wonderful novel, The Power yeah. and the Glory, about that. Yes. So the violence of the Church created the counter-violence of the agnostic of the atheist, which is not your tradition in Norway. Mm -hmm. And so in order to appease the situation, we have created this uh, bill in uh, 1905, separation of the sh uh, st state and the church, which worked quite well between the Catholics, the Protestants, and the rest of the society. So when Islam came on the stage in the 70s, 50s, in, in, in consistent numbers. So the rules were, were about to change, and many voices asked for a, a different situation for Islam. They said yeah. it's a minority religion, so it deserves another treatment. And uh, this is a discussion today, which is going on. Should we uh, reserve a different treatment to Muslims? because they, they, they come from oppressed countries, they've been colonized, and should, so should we consider the religion as being different from Catholicism and Protestantism, yeah. or should we treat them as we treat uh, ordinary believers? Yeah, right, yeah. And so I think, it's, um, well, my, my, my answer, and it's only, not only my answer, but it's, only, it's also, also the answer of many enlightened Muslims in France mm -hmm. is, Treat Islam as you treat any other religion. Yes. We adults, and um, maybe we will talk about uh, it later. But for instance, the, the law about the Islamic scarf, which has been voted in 2004, yeah. has been approved by uh, around 70 percent of the Muslim women, French mm -hmm. Muslim women. Yeah. So um, yes, there are some interesting paradoxes here. You know? I mean, as, as everybody here probably knows, I mean the. The first affair foulard, the the first hijab affair, uh, took place in France in the 1980s, and it's a mother of all subsequent uh, hijab affairs. Okay, which we have we have these sort of recurrent waves of hijab affairs. It takes about three or four years between each time they they explode, and and in several European countries at the same time. But the very first one was. In the, in the small French town when two schoolgirls wanted to wear the hijab to school and were not allowed to do so, and this created. A, a big sort of principled debate about the role of religion in, um, in, in public life. But you know, I, I think, uh, hopefully, I mean, there are people in the audience who disagree more with you than, than you do, because we've got to have some disagreement. I disagree, I think I disagree with you in, in a number of, uh, uh, of uh, concrete cases, but not regarding the role of religion. I, I think it's, uh, it, it should be obvious. And it's also a big paradox. Uh, that many of the, say, the Iranians who came to, to Europe, they, they fled the, you know, a theocracy, I mean, a, a, a totalitarian regime run by, uh, by fundamentalist priests, and, and they, they fled it. Arriving in Europe, they, they discover that they are being uh, discriminated for that which they fled, namely uh, Orthodox Islam. And I have Iranian friends, and also people from other parts of the Muslim world, who are, who are quite exasperated at the fact that they are being represented in the public debate in Norway by imams. It is as if a Catholic, a conservative Protestant priest from Western Norway should represent me. 
you know. Uh, so, uh, quite so. I mean, let's, uh, you know, uh, let's agree about this. Um, now, in order to find some areas of disagreement, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, isn't, isn't there, I, I mean, I tried to ask you about that, but let me ask it in a, more, in a blunter way. Isn't, isn't there a real danger uh, of, uh, of alienating the rest of the world if Europeans continue to talk about the, the uh, legacy of the Enlightenment and of democratic values as something we have invented and want to export to the world? To many people outside, it just appears as a new form of colonialism. You told us what to do in the past and what to think. When you came in with your with your soldiers, with your missionaries, with the colonial officers, and now they have left, but you return with uh, with the gospel of, of human rights and multi-party democracy once again telling us what to do. And it is a fact that multi-party democracy works well in some countries and not in others. And probably not in very ethnically divided African countries, where what they need is unity. Um, where multi-ethnic, multi-party democracy, which they were they were persuaded or more or less forced, you know, by the World Bank and by donor, donors and by the United Nations to introduce multi-party democracy and as a result societies quickly uh, went into a sort of a permanent state of civil war between ethnic groups because all the parties were ethnic. So um, isn't there something to, uh, to recommend, I mean, a, a broader sense of pluralism in which um, it is not just the European model. Other models can work. Other models? Yeah, than the European model. Or is this a dangerous, is this a slippery slope which would lead us toward cultural relativism, do you think? Yeah. Um, well, you know, today the, the, the colonists of the Enlightenment idea are more, the, are more the Americans than the Europeans. So Europeans tend to be extremely modest. And I remember a, a sentence by Jacques Chirac who said at the beginning of, of this century, he was in Tunis precisely, and he said, well, you know the Arabs of their own ways, as long as you have food in your, in your dish, it's fine, and human rights will come afterwards. Mm -hmm. And when you have this kind of position, which is, I would, I would call it a relativist position, you know, we, we are Europeans, but we don't have to teach you anything, and we have to respect your ways of uh, doing. Then a few years later, later that was exactly what happened in, in Tunis uh, last winter. You have young uh, Tunisian demonstrators uh, telling us, well, for years you have uh, dug us into tyranny and misery, and uh, you have kept your, the human rights for yourself, mm -hmm. and you have deprived us, uh, deprived us of, those, uh, of those rights. Mm -hmm. You have supported the uh, tyrannic regimes, mm -hmm. and today you don't do anything. Yeah. And it's true that most European countries when these um, demonstrations started in, in Egypt or in Tunisia, have made many mistakes. The, the, the biggest one being uh, that of the French foreign minister offering uh, the, the Tunisian government to send uh, our policemen, mm -hmm. which had a good discipline and sense of order, oh, in order to crush yeah. the demonstration. And that yeah. was made such a, <laughs> that was made in such a sweet tone by such a well-bred lady is that nobody uh, reacted first, but it was a major mistake. I think mm -hmm. we are always wrong to lock up people <coughs> in an image of uh, misery and feudalism, you know. Yes. So, uh, yes. you, you speak about Africa, you're right. Multipartism in Africa can lead many countries to civil war. But look what happened in Ivory Coast after 10 years of, uh, of the civil war, in the end, one candidate, which had, who has been normally elected, came to power after ejecting uh, the one who didn't want to leave uh, the presidential s seat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. it's a very complicated story, but I think in the long term, yeah. those ideas tend to prove to be universal. Yes, yes. I think, yes, I, I agree with you. I think they're universal, and I also think you can find traces of them, say, in, in Chinese and Indian philosophy. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Ashoka, for instance, in India was a Buddhist king. Yeah. Uh, has laid the foundation for human rights. In Is many it? ways, yeah. In yeah. Many ways, yes. yeah but, you know, the example of Tunisia is interesting because Tunisia seems to be a sort of ambiguous case here because uh, Tunisia, unlike, say, Libya, seems to have a critical mass of, you might say, civil society, middle class people. And the people who went out and demonstrated 
where you know they were some of them were school teachers and lawyers and journalists and people who had never been out in the streets <coughs> before, uh, and who who wanted uh, you know who wanted their civil rights and who wanted to move towards uh, towards pluralism. But then you you move to countries like Iraq or certainly Afghanistan, where there was this incredible naivete on the part of uh, of the Western powers and especially the United States before they went in, believing that you could just remove the bad people, the Taliban, and install one of ours, and then you'll have democracy. Then you'd have something which, which is more, more or less reminiscent of our own society. And we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that, as, as people do in the Ouija, that really, in their heart of hearts, everybody is the Ouija. We just have to teach them, you know, just show them that they are. <laughs> they just haven't discovered it yet, you see? But they are the Ouijans. Uh, and uh, I had a visitor from Afghanistan here some years ago, and we were comparing Afghanistan and Norway. And, uh, and I was saying that, you know, the thing about Norway is that if you park your car in the wrong place, They'll get you. It gets towed away or you get a traffic fine, I mean, a parking fine. And if you don't pay it, they'll come and get you. Sooner or later, you'll have to pay. They can get you into trouble. And he says that, you know, in Kabul, that's not the problem. The problem is finding a part of the street which hasn't been blasted away either by Taliban or the Americans. So because, of course, they don't have, you know, people who go around giving traffic tickets. So unless we realize that the world is diverse in this way, we'll get nowhere. <coughs> By, by, you know, preaching the gospel of, of democracy and enlightenment. Well, in, in fact, uh, what we realize with um, the Arab uh, demonstration is that we, don't have to, we do not have to preach the gospels because the gospel is preaching itself naturally. You know, people in, in, in West Africa or in, in, in Asia, they, they watch television, they, they hear stories, they know how we live. Mm -hmm. uh, they know our flaws, but they know also the, which qualities we enjoy and which quality of life we enjoy in, in Western Europe. Uh, women, most of the time, know that if they cross the Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean sea they will maybe enjoy more rights than they have in Muslim archaic societies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so democracy is preaching itself uh, from mouth to mouth, from ear to ear, uh, all around the world. And we are just coming out of 10 years of uh, U.S. crusade yeah. to um, propagate democracy, uh, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and um, this crusade ended in America with the election of Barack Obama. And uh, we realized that uh, some, something had taken uh, the power into the White House which was ideology. Yeah. So the main thing we can blame uh, George Bush on, we can blame him on many things, yeah. but uh, is that the neocons mm -hmm. were in fact uh, Bolsheviks on the right side. Mm -hmm. First of all because yeah. Yeah. Mo most of the neocons, the core of the movement uh, comes, we have to remember that, from uh, Crystal, who was a Trotskyite in, uh, after World War II. And so they have switched from the extremely left to the right, but they have uh, kept the Trotskyite uh, uh, ideology of the permanent revolution. Yeah. And when you hear uh, all those speak people speaking, uh, Kaplan, uh, mm -hmm. Crystal, and all the houses, they, they, they speak like uh, uh, some French revolutionaries of the, of the end of the 18th century. Let's propagate democracy. Yeah. Uh, through our bayonets, you know, we will force the people to turn democratic. And uh, yeah. beyond all the cynicism and materialism of those, of those, uh, of this government, I think this was uh, the, the basic idea that, as you said, you, you can export democracy. You know, in a few months, mm -hmm. you arrive, you topple down the tyrants, mm -hmm. and then people turn to be uh, friendly with you and they want to adapt the laws of the free market yeah. and, and, and the parliamentary life. And that's not exactly what happened in Iraq and, and, uh, and no. Afghan in Afghanistan uh, and Israel. No, no. Uh, no I think, I think uh, it's, 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 probably, it's probably true, but what we need to keep in mind is that uh, society is still different in fairly fundamental ways. I mean, we have, yes, we have people we can talk to in virtually every country. I mean, people who, you and you and I can talk to. We speak as it were the same language because we have been exposed to some of the same ideas of individualism, of modernity, and you relate to the state, and you relate to the market, and you relate to mobility, and maybe to the internet, and so on, whereas uh, lots of people are more or less cut off from this. 
So uh, one runs the risk of creating, uh, in, for example, in parts of Africa, where there is a huge gulf, you know, dividing the uh, masses of the people from the urban middle classes. Uh, you run the risk of creating a society which is, on the face of it, democratic, but where nothing really happens out in the countryside. So, I mean, I've been to places in Kenya where nothing much has happened in, in, in 30 years, you know. And what they want are wells. They want a proper well where they can get clean water. They don't even talk about having a tap because that's science fiction for them. And, and maybe some solar cell, solar cell panels so that they can watch a bit of TV, you know, that sort of thing. And if, the, uh, if they belong to the Luo ethnic groups, of course they'll vote for the Luo candidates when there's an election. Because in, in Africa, a lot of politics is what, uh, I think it was Bayard, I mean, it was a French social scientist who spoke about la politique du ventre, the politics of the stomach. And, they, and they, what they said in Kenya around the time of the last election was that now it's our time to eat. It's our time to eat, which is very different from the ideas, the sort of uh, the more lofty ideas we have in this part of the world about uh, about democracy. I'm not talking against um, what you're saying. I'm just saying that to many people there are other scarcities at play. But I'd like to ask you another question, if it's okay, <coughs> related, yes, yes, a related yes. one, because there was a debate many years ago between Jean-Paul Sartre and Alain Touraine. Jean-Paul Sartre held in his infamous preface to France Fanon, which you have written about. Uh, the Wretched of the Earth, um, which is, you know, <laughs> probably one of the worst things he's written. And it's much worse than the book. You know, Fanon was a lot better, in fact, yeah, in anyway. Much more intelligent. That's exactly, that. and much less violent. In, in a sense, he didn't romanticize violence, at least in the same way that Sartre did at the time. But, uh, but Sartre was growing old and he needed to say something new, perhaps. I don't know. But there's a debate. Sartre held that scarcity in itself breeds uh, a re revolutionary spirit, you know, and, uh, and uprisings. Scarcity in itself. Well, Toulon said, no, it's not enough to be poor. You also have to be enlightened. You also need to have an understanding of your own situation. And historically, isn't it the case that the people who revolt tend to be the middle classes? Do peasants revolt? Well, they do, but not with any lasting result, do they? So aren't we talking, when you talk about Tunisia, aren't we talking about the, I mean, I mean, just asking as a matter of fact, you know, not as a criticism, aren't we talking about the urban middle classes when, when all is said and done? Yes, and you're right, because formerly uh, the working classes were <coughs> taking to the street because they were led by a, a party, which was most of the time the Communist Party or the Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. But they had been taught into schools, they had had a, an education through strikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, nowadays, as the uh, working class is decreasing in numbers, in most, of, um, in most of the southern countries, as you said, the middle class are taking to the streets. And uh, the, the example of Tunisia is interesting because in spite of its defects, Ben Ali mm -hmm. had made a lot of progress for, for Tunisians. He had given rights to the, to the women, allowed them to uh, go to school, to go to university, to take jobs. And um, in spite of everything bad he did, the Tunisian society is probably one of the most advanced in Maghreb and the, the most highly educated. So that explains, you know, I think it's, it's um, one of uh, Tocqueville's uh, um, dogma. He said that revolutions burst not when people are oppressed, but when people's conditions is improving. So yeah. that's why if you're a tyrant, don't try to start reforms because those reforms will kill you at the end. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the more, the, the, if, you, if you open a, a small space of freedom, people will ask for more freedom. Yeah. And that will uh, probably, probably lead to revolution at the, in the end. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. interestingly, yeah, interestingly, the parallel development has taken, part, has taken place to some extent in this part of the world. Well, you might say that the social democracy, the welfare state, they succeeded too well. Because people are now so secure and feel so safe in this country <laughs> that they've begun to vote for a totally, a totally responsible, opportunistic and bigoted right-wing populist party instead. Which has become, has become the new sort of working class party. Because the, because the welfare state succeeded too well. <laughs> Yes, well, in France it's not succeeding. Because, <laughs> you know, we, we're on the eve of bankruptcy, so uh, we love the welfare state, but we cannot afford uh, to, to pay for it anymore. So the situation of France, in a way, economically is, is quite different, unfortunately for us. We'd like to have some oil in our, in our uh, yeah, yeah. soil, you know, in order yeah. to, to, um, to, to empty the deficit. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. 
But if we look a bit uh, towards the future, I mean, uh, we've spoken a bit about uh, the relationship between, you might say, European ideas and other people's ideas and the rest of the world, and to what extent these ideas are European. Um, but uh, if we just try to look a bit ahead, um, we, because we were asked by Kaya and by the organizers to discuss the future of European identities. Well, if Europe is pluralism, um, you know, I've always thought that, or for many years, that a good founding myth for Europe is the myth of Icarus. Uh, you know, Icarus and his father Daedalus, they were held captive by the, by the Minotaur, okay, by this horrible monster in Crete. And this is one of the oldest myths that we have, you know, from our, from our uh, shared, as it were, history. Um, and they make wings of wax, or the, rather, they make wings, and they attach them to the body with wax. And Icarus is incapable of sort of staying low, because he feel, he's filled by hubris, you know, by all the wood, as we say in Norwegian. And so he flies up towards the sun. The sun melts the wax, so the wings fall off, and he falls dead to the ground. Now, this is a myth that the Greeks told each other in order to warn each other against excesses, against uh, an exaggerated faith in your own ability and in order to instill a certain degree of self-doubt and self-criticism in order to improve. Isn't this a nice myth of origin for us Europeans? And couldn't it be exploited you know, for, the, for the future development of a European identity? Or do we need something more macho? Something more like the Arabs and the Americans? No, I think we have to, uh, we have to go back to the ancients in, in many ways for our personal life, for our political life. And uh, we, we still have a lot to learn from the Greeks and the Latins. But I, I don't think that Europe today is uh, threatened by hubris. Because hubris has made uh, uh, the tissue of European history until World War II. And so when we, we, we almost suicide, suicided <laughs> ourselves with this hubris, with uh, each nation of Europe trying to take over the rest of the continent. Yeah. And the Germans have yeah. been the last example of this hubris, yes. and it didn't work. No. And then the colonial empires were dismantled, and uh, in retrospect, it's, it's an excellent thing. So uh, I, I would say, in the contrary, that Europe today is more threatened by modesty. You know, we we have a lot of difficulty to assert ourselves, but hubris has crossed the Atlantic and has gone to the White House, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's exactly what happened in the last 20 years for the Americans. And in, in this regard, the election of Barack Obama uh, is extremely important for me because in, in one way, Obama is the leader who tries to recapture the American dream and who, who says to the American, yes, we can. In fact, no, they can't anymore. You know, uh, uh, the, the, there is a limit to the sky. You know these English yeah. expressions, the sky is the limit. No, sorry. There is yeah. a limit before the sky. And I think Barack Obama will be the president, if he's reelected, which I wish, who will teach the American people that they are not powerful anymore, that they cannot transform the world, that they are limited, that they will be touched probably by another financial crisis in the coming years. And that, and that with all its power, all its uh, military uh, potential, mm -hmm. the American people are themselves limited. Yeah. And uh, so they should turn to soft power in, in, instead of trying to, to, to <coughs> persist in hard power. Mm -hmm. And I think will be, this will be the paradoxical task of Barack Obama. Yeah. And that, that is why he's so uh, hated by a part of the of the right of the, of the neocons, yeah. who, who try to keep up with the old, uh, aggressive American vision. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the Americans do not know yet how weak they are. They think they're still the, the best and the yeah. biggest. But uh, if there is still a lot of energy in the United States, yeah. you can feel you know, the undercurrent depression. Yeah. They have taken a blow, they have taken a blow in 9-11, yeah. and they have taken a second blow in 2008, yeah. And they will probably take a third one, and the, now they're losing wars. They're, they're losing the war in Afghanistan, yes. and there is a lesson to to, to take from yeah. this. And, and China is winning Africa and moving into Latin America. I mean, we haven't. I mean, during this conversation, we haven't even begun to talk yes. about the, the role of China, because it's quite clear that, in some sense, you know, <coughs> Europe today is the western tip of the Eurasian Peninsula, 
I mean, if you have a peninsula or a continent, it's, it is peninsula on the Eurasian continent. Europe is fairly small in geographic terms, but it's very diverse. And has, as you rightly point out, contributed quite a lot. But Europe is increasingly defined through its relationship to the outside world. So not least the United States, which has been the major superpower for, for a very long time and, and, and is currently the only superpower. It's not going to last long. I think China is coming in the next five, ten years or so to challenge that position. And through its relation to its former empire, certainly France and, 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 and the UK. Um, when, you meet, when you meet West Africans in, in, the, in Paris, it's not the same as meeting West Africans in Berlin, because they are French in a sense. They were, they were at least, they were évolués. You know, they were the children of the saint maur and the Oufoué Bali, the, uh, the, the Frenchified, uh, French, Frenchified Africans. <coughs> similarly, in, in the UK, you have very old established, you know, Indian and, and, and East African communities in, uh, in the UK. So you have a relationship with empire, uh, or with the, with the, with the ex as it were, empire. Then we have a relationship with, with the Muslim world, or with, uh, with Muslims. Very near, neighbours are, are, are to some extent migrating, lots of frictions, partly I think because many of us Europeans, certainly in Scandinavia, we've forgotten what religion is about. We don't realise that to some people some things are simply sacred and we no longer understand what that means, which leads to a lot of friction and a lot of, of, uh, of uh, trouble on both sides. Then we have the relationship with China. And my prediction is that uh, we Europeans are going to have to go back to the 13th, 14th century and think, what was it then that gave us the competitive edge over China and try to repeat that? What do you think? You know, I, I think, personally, personally, I think I'm going to miss the US, you know, as a superpower when China takes over. <laughs> I'm going to miss the, the time when we could listen to our Frank Zappa records and watch Jerry Seinfeld and Woody Allen and think that, you know, after all, the Americans are not so bad, you know, they, they can produce good art and, and good music. Well, the streets, they still produce uh, the, the, the world culture nowadays. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's not produced in China, it's not produced in, in Russia. It's uh, produced <coughs> in some ways by Indians and, and also by Brazilians, which are the two most uh, advanced mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cultures. Mm -hmm. But America remains uh, the nation which produces most of our cultural standards. And we love uh, American series, we love American fiction, American movies. It still remains the first in that regard. But, um, but of course the Chinese are coming little by little. And maybe we could, uh, just to give one answer to the, to the question you ask, what is killing the West? Why is killing the West? Why, why are we losing ground in front of uh, strong competitors like uh, the Indians and the Chinese? First you say it because they're hungry. <coughs> the yeah. policy of the stomach is the most important one. No. And, uh, uh, they have empty uh, bellies, and our belly is too full. Yeah. And uh, no, no, you know, our policy now is not to eat, especially cut cucumbers, <laughs> which might kill us. Yeah, right. Uh, to kill a cucumber yeah, from yeah, Germany. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and uh, so that, that, that's the difference. But I think there is another, this is probably another uh, aspect of Western culture, which uh, you perceive very precisely in the United States. It is greed, you know, an incredible uh, greed, an appetite for money and enrichment, which leads uh, most uh, of the Western society to abandon, for instance, scientific studies. Yes. The state of education in Western society is pathetic. French school, German school, American school, unless you, you have enough money to put your kids into private school, is in a um, very bad situation. Yeah. Whereas Chinese people, Indian people, they work very hard, you know, they put their children in, 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 in good schools, they, they, they force them to work for 10, 12 hours every day. Mm -hmm. So they give to their own kids the education we receive, my, my generation received, you know. You have to succeed, you have to work hard. Yeah. And um, so which is killing uh, the Western society is I think you said that at the beginning, it's our excessive success. Mm -hmm. We succeeded too well and we thought we would remain the, the first, but little by little our uh, success is being uh, uh, devoured by young societies which believe in themselves. You know, the Chinese have no doubt about the absolute superiority of the Chinese uh, uh, culture. Same for the Indians, Brazilian also. Mm -hmm. young. African nations are extremely confident in themselves, yeah. and and so we, uh, and uh, especially for the American society, I think the greed is a, 
this uh, incredible uh, lust, not for the flesh, but for the dollar. Yeah. Seems to me a, an incentive on one hand, but also a grave uh, on the other. It, 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 it's a major danger. Yeah. That's why there are two um, professions which are extremely successful today in Western society. It's lawyer on one hand uh -huh. and trader on the other hand. Uh -huh. And you cannot have a big society and a strong society which with financial uh, people on one hand and, and lawyers on the other hand. Uh -huh. You know, it, it, it's not enough to make a, a strong skeleton for a, no. a progressive society. No, no. I don't and it's right. I mean, if you change, sorry, if I just one final comment, I mean, just to, to build on what you said. I mean, if we think about uh, Marx's old theory about the rising and falling classes, he had this theory about his, uh, through history, you could always trace the rising and the falling classes. So in his time, the feudal classes were clearly on the way down, and the bourgeoisie were, not, were on the way up. And he was hoping, and he thought it would happen in his own lifetime. In fact, when they wrote the Communist Manifesto, he and Engels thought that the revolution was just around the corner, that the, the working class was a new rising class, I see, when the bourgeoisie would, would decline. If we, think, if we transfer this way of thinking to, to nations, it's, it's fairly easy to see that, well, Norwegians are probably not the rising class anymore. I mean, we, in Nor Norway, like all of Western Europe, it's... it's is full now of people from Poland, Lithuania, and other other people from the new member states who come here and you know who do all kinds of work, who work long hours. I go to Poland sometimes, and I notice at the rush hour in the afternoon it starts at 6 p.m. You know, and here it starts at 2:30. Yeah? People start leaving at work, and on Friday it starts at noon. You know? So uh, yeah, as, as a sort of picture of, of the way the, the world is going, and the Chinese, you have this notion that. So many builders, I mean people working with, in construction, okay, in Poland, are now working in the West, that they have a hard time finding people to build new houses in, in Warsaw. So they get the, the higher end companies from Ukraine, who can do it more cheaply, from Ukraine. But the question is, what are the men going to do in Ukraine? Well, they hire people from Kazakhstan. Yes. And but what are the Kazakhs, you know? And sooner or later, in all these sort of chains of, of import of labor and of, of exchange rates, you know, different exchange rates, there are Chinese at the end. Or maybe in the, there are Chinese at the end of all of them. <laughs> so who are the rising? Uh, who is the rising superpower? I think there can be no doubt. Yes, but even in China, you have strikes to get better mm. salaries. That's and true. Just that's a major change in Bangladesh or yeah, so, in many uh, poor countries. So there will be an equilibrium at the end, you know, because yeah. all those people they work the hard, end. but they work hard to live better. Exactly. We should never forget this. Those people do not come uh, in Europe or in the United States to invade us. They, right. they come to improve their lives. Exactly. And that's, we have to see them as, a, you know, a migrant is a modern entrepreneur. Is mm -hmm. someone who has made a calculation. It, it, what do I lose? What do I gain? Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we, we, we should understand when they arrive, you know, in the, in, on our coast or... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Right. I think Kaya wants us to... Yeah. Uh, Okay, Thank you very much, <laughs> gentlemen, for this discussion. And uh, now we'll take uh, questions from, from you. So, could you please direct your questions in English? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, it's for uh, Mr. Brockman. You stand up and speak up. Yeah, speak up. Uh, I, I, I read an article a, a few months ago on, uh, on your essay called The Art of uh, Suffering in Harper's Magazine. And it made me think about how it could be different, the perception of suffering in Norway compared to France, two European countries. So I was wondering if you could, if, from what you know of Norway, if you could compare what the perception of suffering between these two countries or societies would be. Well, on, on the aspect of suffering, I think we are very close because uh, for me, uh, Norway is in Europe. And the essay was about the duty of happiness in the Western world and how the right to be happy has, has turned uh, after 68 into the duty to be happy. And uh, what I try to say in this essay is that uh, after the Enlightenment period, by posing happiness as the only horizon, we have totally uh, discriminated the experience of suffering, which was the basis of our religious faith in the ancient times. You know, because Christianity, Catholicism, Protestantism is also based on the experience of suffering. And uh, by, uh, by uh, posing the uh, happiness as the only horizon, 
we do not know anymore how to deal with suffering. You know, all religions deal with uh, with pain. You know, Catholicism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, they all explain why we have to suffer in order to, to be humans. And for the first time, the Western societies uh, try to do the contrary. Uh, suffering is an ex should be an exception, and happiness should be the norm. And we try very hard to achieve this goal, but in fact, it's very complicated. And that is why we are probably the first societies in the world where people are, are, are unhappy not to be happy, because everybody should be happy every day. <laughs> Uh, and, and seven uh, seven days out of seven, mm -hmm. and that I don't know if you if, if I make myself myself clear, but that's what I try to to explain in this small piece of Harper, which was uh, an excerpt of my book, which was published in English at, at, at this time. Yeah, just very quickly to elaborate, because I I, I noticed that uh, Norway, being a Lutheran country compared to France, mainly Catholic, I believe the perception of suffering is is different. This is my perception, so I was just wondering if you, if you had a different one. Well, maybe I should ask you, but uh, well, it depends if you're a believer or not. You know, <coughs> if, if you're uh, a convinced Catholic, uh, suffering is an experience which you offer to, to God. You know, and when I was in a Catholic school, you know, uh, we were told every day that. Uh, God wanted us to be sick, to be ill, to be miserable, to be poor, in order to gain our paradise later on after death. And of course we were not very convinced by this kind of uh, teaching, but uh, we were young. Uh, so maybe Protestantism has a different aspect, maybe a more progressive uh, way to fight against evils and distress and disease. But I, I would say that today uh, those two uh, those differences have erased, and we are very similar in no way as we are in France. You know, when people are sick, they take pills, and uh, we try to fight uh, poverty, uh, inequality, and, and things. Yeah. Do you know there are not just religious differences, but also cultural differences? I mean, within Catholicism, you have countries like Mexico, for example, or in certain Latin American countries, where suffering is something, something associated with a woman's life. And this is partly why you have the cult of Maria, you know, Marianismo, el Marianismo. Uh, how women have, I mean, la Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, you have these sort of people who have seen the Virgin Mary all over the place. I mean, for a while in the 19th century, I mean, there were, there were hundreds of sightings of, of, of uh, the Virgin Mary in various sites in, in both Mexico and, uh, and Portugal. Whereas men should not suffer in the same way, because men should be macho, men should have honor, you know. Men have honor, women have shame. So women, because they are shameful creature, they, uh, creatures, they suffer. Whereas in Norway, I think it, you know, nowadays, it strikes me, I don't know about, uh, about France in the same way, if, it, if you have it the same way. If you can portray yourself as a victim, you get a lot of sympathy. So if you're a transgressor, and if you're in difficulties, I mean, there are newspapers write bad things about you, okay? If you can only portray yourself as a victim, suddenly it turns. The, the, the tables are turned and people would, would view you with a lot of sympathy, and you somehow won. If you can only see it, I mean, we had a prime minister <laughs> who had difficulties. He, he, he ran the coalition government, and they had real difficulties, you know, getting them to talk to each other. Okay, this was a non socialist uh, government. And then he went on sickly because of uh, some, some nerve problems. And he received a lot of sympathy. Whereas my notion was that well, in some other countries he wouldn't, because he wouldn't have been seen as fit to run the country. Well, yes, I think this is a common uh, trait of uh, <coughs> Christian societies. Was that? which is a sympathy given to the victim that you just said for a, for a very simple reason is that uh, uh, the central symbol of this religion is the Christ who has been crucified so um, so the Christ has become uh, the symbol of all victims you know every victim can identify himself with Jesus Christ because he has been tortured he's been despised he's been uh, flagellated and he's been killed and in the end and uh, victimology is probably is probably a perversion of Christian societies, and which has been reactivated with World War II, when the Jewish people has become the symbol mm -hmm. of the victims, yes. and that is that explains why today the Shoah, the Holocaust, has 
uh, is a kind of label, a brand that every minority would like to appropriate for itself. You know, everyone would like to have his own private Shoah in order to appear as the main victim of history, and uh, which explain uh, what the historians have called the competition between victims. And there was always a huge competition between victims in, in, in the world medias. And everybody tries to say, I'm the most suffering victim, please consider my case. And this explains also why uh, there is a conflict of interest between all uh, uh, suffering people who try to capture the, the, the ears of the public opinion. And uh, so on one hand, we are uh, people obsessed with happiness, comfort, well-being, but on the other hand, we, we would like to attract sympathy uh, through our own sufferings. And I think we are torn between those two aspirations. Thank you. We have another question over there. My name is Eric and I want to start. Thank you both for a very interesting and, and thoughtful uh, discussion. And I want to ask you um, about the discussion which is going on all over uh, Europe. Um, to me it seems like, uh, I can identify two phenomena going on at the same time in relation to the temperature uh, in the public, in the heated debate. Uh, you have the rise of the right-wing populism, which really shows the hostility towards uh, the immigrants. And at the same time, uh, at least in my view, you have, uh, as I think the caricature showed, you have a reluctance to go into legitimate criticism of the behavior of, 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 the, of for example, Muslims. So I want to ask you, do you think that those two problems, do you agree with me that they both are uh, big problems? And, and if you would say, would you say that one is bigger than the other in terms of conducting this debate? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's, a, it's a big and, big and complicated question. You know, um, I find it always very difficult, you know, when, when people ask me, you know, what, what is the situation now with pluralism? I mean, we don't say multiculturalism anymore because it's, been a, it's a misused word and it's associated with segregation, you know, and with a cult of culture, which few of us uh, uh, support. But let's call it diversity. I mean, uh, what is the situation with diversity? Which way, in which direction is society moving? And you cannot give an unequivocal answer to it because all tendencies are present at the same time. You have sal Salafism, which is, which is a Puritan, you know, fundamentalism form of Islam, which is spreading, probably not very fast, but which has its supporters in Oslo. And I see that as a youth revolt, you know, as a kind of, it's, it's, their, it's their version of Café Blitz, which was, the, you know, the home of the punks, okay, in the 70s and 80s. Well, seriously, you know, that's what it is. It's against their parents who they see as slack Muslims. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and against majority society, which to some extent excludes them. You know, they feel that they're not getting a fair deal. So you have that at the same time, you have uh, hybridization, you have mixing, you have creolization, you have all, the, all, all those the second generation of people who really identify with this country and who, in, through the process of becoming a Norwegian, also contribute to enlarging you know, what it means to be Norwegian by giving more options, as it were. You can be Norwegian in more ways than before. So there is no unequivocal uh, answer to it. And regarding, uh, are we too polite or are we too rude to, towards minorities? You know, I think the people are too polite should be a bit ruder and the rude people should be a bit more, be a bit more polite. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's all I can say. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have another question. No, but there's another answer, I think. Oh, oh Maybe. No, no. you want to answer? I would love that to hear question. Mr. Bruckner. Yeah, okay. No, no, ahead, it's, a, it's a very complicated question. Uh, maybe I should answer about populism. Um, I think populism in Europe comes from uh, the wrong analysis of the left. I think that the left for the last 20 years has made a, a huge mistake considering immigration. Uh, because it assumed that... Um, you know, the left is in, is in a strange contradiction. On one way, it says we have to impose borders to the goods and the commodities. We should not uh, uh, open all the borders to uh, goods coming from China, from the United States, or from other parts of the world. But we should open the, the borders for every kind of foreigner who wants to, to come in our country. And why, why is that? It's because, especially in France, but maybe it's the same in Norway, social democracy has become it's a party for, for the middle classes. Mm -hmm. And the left has lost the working class. And it, it has, the working class now, it used to be communist, the communist party has decreased, so now it's going to the extreme right. 
because only the extreme right gives those, this working class the impression to defend its own interest. And why is it so? It's because who is suffering of uh, immigration? It's not the middle classes, which, which is lives in nice areas in, in cities or in the suburbs. It's uh, people of the, of, the, of the working class which receive you know, waves of uh, Africans or Arabs or you know, people from every country and which enters in, into a deep competition with those people who, who are ready to work for smaller salaries, mm -hmm. who do not uh, join unions all the time, and uh, who, do not have, who do not share the, always <coughs> the same culture. And uh, had the left made a better analysis of the new situation generated by uh, the migrants, it, uh, populism would have not uh, appear as it, it appears today in Europe, in most of European countries. Second point is uh, uh, the thinking about Islam. I, 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 made a, I mentioned it before, but uh, you know we didn't see Islam as a strong uh, monotheist religion. We saw it as the expression of the oppressed and the wretched of the earth. We say, no, the Muslims are oppressed, so we have to to um, be more uh, indulgent with them. And uh, for instance, the violent uh, verses in the Quran should be taken not as uh, uh, ordinary uh, speakings, but sh should be taken you know, as, as something unimportant. And when the first uh, demonstration of fanaticism appeared, when it happened, in, for instance, in Holland, the assassination of Theo van Gogh, the uh, the Mohammed uh, cartoons affair in Norway and in Denmark, um, uh, most of people on the left reacted very softly, said, well, no, we should not take this too seriously. And who asked us to react with violence? Muslim uh, Democrats, most of the time. People like Ayan Irsi Ali, like many other uh, Muslim women who were forced to Silence by uh, the Salafists or by the Wahhabis or by uh, you know other um, uh, radicals of this religion, who told us you show yourself unfaithful to your own ideals. You admit into your societies people which um, profess uh, very uh, different ideas from what you believe in, and uh, I think um, in this regard. The French left has moved forward uh, little by little, and now is, is, is seeing things with more lucidity. But in the end, uh, the claim for secularism will come from the Muslims themselves. Especially in France, we have, say the statistic, we have five million Muslims in France, people from North Africa and uh, Western African countries. In fact, the figures are inaccurate. Uh, we have maybe five million people coming, uh, second generation from Algeria or, or Morocco or Tunisia. But those people are not believers, you know. They are not more Muslims than I am uh, Catholic or than you are Unitarian. Yes. They go to the mosque sometimes, they do Ramadan sometimes, but they drink wine, and they would like, you know, to be um, left at peace with their own belief. Yeah. And so there are, there are many tensions in, inside the French society. Yeah. But yeah. little by little, I think uh, secularism is is working as end. And we will speak le maybe of this later. But okay. there, are, uh, there are two models in Europe: there are the Anglo-Saxon model and the French one. And uh, I think the French one is working better, whatever we think. But it, it, it's working. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting topic which would need a lot of time. But yeah. I'd also like just as a, as a short rejoinder. I mean, we should just be careful, not to believe that while we denounce intolerance, bigotry, and violence in the name of religion or culture is not the same thing as saying that the multicultural project has failed. You can perfectly well, well be in favor of diversity and be against violence. And let's also keep in mind that of all the terrorists, I, I'm no more a friend of Wahhabis than you are, you'll be nice that, but of all the terrorist attacks that have taken place in Europe in the last few years, very few have been committed by Muslims, you know. Basque separatists, the separatists are in fact responsible for a lot more deaths, at least now. That is the case. So let's just, I mean, remain a bit level-headed about this. But of course, I agree with you that uh, there are some limits.
Yes, I don't and know. also, also the fact that most, as you say, most Muslims, as everybody else, they've got their own personal projects. They want to support their families. They want a good life. They want a good education for their children. Yes, what we can say ten years after 9/11 is that globally, uh, Islamic terrorism has failed. Yeah. It has failed. Yeah. There yeah. was no more bomb attack in the United States. Uh, so, uh, same in Europe. So. Um, Islamic terrorism is, is still uh, still exists in, in you know because it's a multinational which has been free, uh, it's, it's a label franchised in, in many countries. It will probably uh, still kill many people, but the only uh, transformation it has made in, into our own minds it has turned us into paranoid paranoids. Yeah, so uh, we, we know that we have to take care when we see an empty luggage on uh, in a station train station or in an airport. We have to go through security uh, measures in, in airports also, which is extremely yeah. boring. Uh, you have to drink your wine before leaving the country. Yes, because exactly. you can't take it with you. Yeah, you have to, take, to throw away your, your, yeah. your bottle of water and, and, and your yeah. tooth, uh, toothpaste. Yeah. But that's all. <laughs> and uh, in the end, uh, Ben Laden has failed. He, he, yeah. has, he has failed. And he has failed also in Muslim countries. So. I do not, don't want to sound too much optimistic because uh, which is failing in Afghanistan and now we're starting back in Yemen nowadays. But uh, you know the huge um, uh, fire that the uh, Islamic uh, insurrection was hoping to, uh, to provoke throughout the Muslim world is not happening. And what we see today in, in Northern Africa and uh, in, in Syria is, is also the incredible lack of slogans against the West and in favor of Islam. And uh, even if they say Allah Akbar, it's probably a way to encourage themselves to fight <laughs> against, uh, for instance in Libya, against Khalifi forces. Mm -hmm. So something is changing. We, should, we have to remain extremely cautious and, and, and careful. And thanks to God, if I may say so, we have excellent secret services especially in France, yeah. we have a long tradition of secret police yeah. <laughs> created by, by Napoleon and Fouché and, uh, and sometimes it does horrible things but sometimes it also helps to defuse uh, bomb attacks which are being prepared every month in, uh, in our countries. Yes. But globally, uh, we, ten years after we can say they failed and, and this proves that the values of freedom and, and human rights are stronger than the values of fanaticism. Thank you. Then we take the next question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite used to speaking English with such a big crowd. The last time I did it actually was in Macedonia in the university, and I was one week after Mr. Hilan Eriksson. And they, they tried to comfort me, and they said that Hilan Eriksson had a big success. So, uh, well, uh, theoretically, I think this is a very interesting discussion, but for me, it's more personal. I live in home, yeah. And in my uh, uh, daughter's uh, second grade, there is approximately 70% Muslims. She is one out of three uh, pupils with a Norwegian background. And this uh, makes some challenges, to put it that way. Um, they put, it's quite common to put hijab on five-year-old girls in Holmdia, yeah? when, uh, when, uh, when these uh, girls are in kindergarten. Um, the reason why they do this, uh, I think, is because they want to make a distance to the Norwegian culture, of course, certain part of, parts of it, at least. Uh, <clears throat> and um, as far as I know, it's not common to put hijab on five-year-old girls in Muslim countries. So the, the question is why are they doing it? <clears throat> when we have parents' meetings, uh, there is also a big corner where Muslim women sit down and they make it clear that no men should sit here. I'm not able to shake hands with these women. Uh, they, don't, they cannot talk to me. And the, the problem is, that the challenge is how can we make a good, uh, how to put it, uh, ambience mm -hmm. under such circumstances. And my question is, how should we meet this? Yes. What can we do? What um, should we ignore it and hope that it will pass away after some generations, or, well, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the hijab is a, is a modern phenomenon, just like the Norwegian folk dress. 
It's a modern traditionalism. It's a way of saying that although we live postmodern lives, lives, we haven't forgotten who we are, where we come from. But of course, uh, it, it can be, it can, it can, it, it's certainly debatable whether it's right, you know, to, to pressurize uh, very young girls to, uh, to wear the hijab. But it may, it, may be, it may mean a lot of things, and there are huge debates about this, so we can't go into them now. But what you're talking about, about the lack of communication, I would see that as a greater problem. You know, I think that's, it, it's very acutely put. And, and again, as Frederick Bartbon said, I mean, we were just chatting about this, that, and the other. He's an old man, you know, so he lived in really a homogeneous Norway when he was a, was a younger man. And he said that it must be hard, you know, to lead a happy life in Norway if you cannot uh, accept gender equality. It must be very difficult to get a good life in Norway because then you continuously feel that society is against me and my values. So if you cannot make peace with gender equality, you're unlikely to get a happy life here. That was his take on it. And, and um, I think there is some truth to that, unless you can isolate yourself in, a, in an enclave, um, which also has its difficulties. The one answer is, but I, I don't think it's, it's not satisfactory for you because you want a solution now. Uh, but second generation, let's see what happens to the second generation. And we're already seeing some indications that you know, they're taking education, in fact, up to the same level as Norwegians, even a bit more, slightly more. And, uh, and there's a huge social mobility in the second generation. So, um, and I'm sure they would, they would, most of those would shake hands with you. But, but I, I, I see the problem, yeah. Well, I think we should never renounce our own values. And yeah. this goes for uh, any kind of minority. That's why France has uh, prohibited uh, young girls to wear the hijab at school and in public uh, buildings. It was a tough fight, but I think in the end we succeeded. Now we have uh, prohibited the niqab, which is a total uh, Islamic veil. It's a little more touchy to, to implement, but uh, you know, uh, women wearing the, the niqab in France are about 2,000, 3,000. Yeah. I know it's not a very liberal uh, law, but uh, I think France is leading the way on this aspect and uh, there will be a lot of frictions, but I'm very confident that it, uh, it will be a success at the end. In which concerns your own daughter, well, if it, if, if it was my own daughter, I would take her off the school and put her somewhere else, but uh, uh, you know, when you uh, settle in a country, you have, you know, in Rome, act like the Romans. So uh, equality between men and women is a prerequisite of uh, Western society. If you do not, do not accept it, it's, it's going to be a major problem. Mm -hmm. So we, go, we should go through education, we should go through uh, 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 arbitration, through dialogue. Uh, in France, for instance, there are uh, many fights between uh, patients and doctors. For instance, a woman who is pregnant, a Muslim woman who is pregnant, doesn't want to be um, examined by a male uh, French doctor. So she demands to be uh, looked at by a woman doctor. And uh, many times in, in emergency room or in a pediatric room, you have a, a husband threatening doctors you know, to, to kill them if they, they, they look at their wives. And uh, so it's a very long process, but of course, if you don't want your daughter to be the victim of this long process, uh, there are probably better ways for, for you to, 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 to make her education. But uh, in the end, we should be confident. But to be confident in uh, the transformation of those migrants, you have to uh, profess your own values with pride. And that's exactly what the, the problem with Europe. Europe doesn't believe in its own values. It always says, oh, I'm sorry, you know, that's the way we do here. But if you want to do differently, please, I don't want to impose anything on you. But in which concerns uh, equality between men and women, I think there should be no toleration. You know, uh, a woman should be able to shake your hand, you should be able to do it. And in which concerns a hijab? I had a, um, I had a speech with Tariq Ramadan in 2004 on the French TV. And I say, I love the hijab, you know, I love it so much that I would like to wear one myself. And I suggest that uh, you, Mr. Ramadan, should wear hijabs too. And everyone, men and women, we should wear Islamic <laughs> scarves, we would be so nice. 
and the fashion could go into this new market. Yeah. And Christian Dior, Prada, uh, Armani should make hijabs for everyone, even for kids, and why not for animals? And of course, uh, you know, and one, I, I, I never understood why uh, derision, derision and mockery could be not considered as political weapons. And, uh, we could, yes, could make demonstration with, uh, you know, with kneecaps, mm. uh, all dressed in, in, in black uh, yeah. dresses. Yeah, and yeah. all I wonder is, how do they get their passport photos taken? And what do they do when they go through security at airports? If you wear a kneecap, what do, what do, you, what do their passport photos look like? I, I don't know, but I think they, now they're forced to, to show their faces, at least at the customs. Yeah, yeah. And, but it's going to be a very uh, complicated issue and an, an economic one because you know most of the customers in Paris in a in nice five-star hotel are people from Saudi Arabia and people from the, the Gulf states and you know so we are afraid to lose their money and uh, if we ask them to take off the, the uh, niqab but I think there will be uh, there will be compromises and after all they have to, to, to know that the niqab is not a Quranic prescription. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Imam of Al-Azhar, which is a great Sunni university in, in, in Cairo, prohibited the niqab. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tacky question. And uh, it's not only the Republican fanaticism, as the Anglo-Saxon said. The New York Times made a headline page two months ago, which scandalized me. He said that French are told Taliban's because we had uh, passed this law about the niqab. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, frankly, uh, it's, it's really a, a little exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Thank but, uh, you. We have two more questions and yeah. five minutes yes. left. So, okay. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I would like to ask both gentlemen about something I, I thought about when Mr. Bruckner mentioned that the, the culture of uh, succeeding and hard work and uh, and making some, making something on the, of, of yourself is not a threat, or, or maybe it's demising in Europe. Mm -hmm. But I would like to point out that this culture is still quite strong in Eastern Europe, which is mm -hmm. a pretty large part of Europe. And when I'm talking about hard work now, I'm I'm not talking about the construction workers. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about highly educated young people. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be difficult for Norwegians to to see them among all the construction workers, but some of them are actually here in Norway. Uh, and that's why I, I would like to ask you, what, uh, how, how do you see uh, their role? Because you, you were mentioning that, uh, you were mention, mentioning China, India, Brazil, and African countries as upcoming uh, superpowers. Uh, how do you see the role of Eastern Europe? Well, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, that on the whole, the opening up that we've seen since 1989 has been wonderful. And that that creates more social justice globally. Because it levels. I mean, as Thomas Friedman quite correctly puts it in this otherwise very superficial book, but, but a good read, you know, the world is flat. Uh, that the, uh, the playing field is now being leveled. We, and, and as a result, in some Norwegian university departments, we just read in the local newspaper, more than half of the uh, PhD students are from East Asia. Uh, in, in computing, mathematics, and so on. Uh, and uh, we're going to see massive influx, you know, from Poland, Ukraine, Russia, as well. So, um, yeah, maybe the center is moving eastwards. You know, it used to be the London, Paris, Berlin, <coughs> axis, okay? Before that, it was Rome. Before that, Athens. And uh, even before that, it was Baghdad and, uh, and uh, or, 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 you know, um, uh, Mesopotamian the oh, cities oh. And, uh, and so on. So maybe it's moving east. That's it. That uh, the, uh, in, in 2050, maybe the main axis is going to be the Warsaw Beijing axis that we, the rest of us will have to relate to. I wouldn't rule that out at all because I see the same thing as you that there is a movement there and that there, there is a sort of a complexity in the culture of many Central East European countries. Yeah. And, and Le Ventre, the uh, the exigencies of the stomach is still there. They still know what sex scarcity is, which also goes a long way, you must remember, to explain the extraordinary mobility among second-generation migrants in this country and in Western Europe as such, because they haven't forgotten what scarcity is. So they don't waste their time studying social anthropology. I mean, they go straight for medicine, law, engineering, dentistry, real jobs with real money. Okay? 
Well, uh, yes, uh, yeah. I think Europe has reconquered its uh, second half, which had been kidnapped, you know, to use uh, the words of uh, Milan Kundera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, this has been done in, in, in now in, in 20 <coughs> years. And in, but, you know, in France, for us, uh, people from uh, Polish ascendance or people from uh, ex Yugoslavia are considered to be ordinary French people with just a more complicated name to spell when you have to write down their name on a, on a paper. But, um, which is true, is that in the western part of Europe we are suffering the ills of rich society, which is, among other things, a disdain for education. <coughs> and uh, we all have kids and we have more or less well succeeded. But one thing strikes me, it is the failure of boys in high schools. In most uh, colleges and, and, and high schools, there is a huge gap between girls and boys. Uh, most boys consider school <coughs> as a boring passage, and you know, they praise those who do not know anything, they praise the ignorance, whereas uh, girls work much better. They, they try to, to succeed, to have good notes. And there is a global tendency, especially through the French school, to, uh, to mock the good pupils and to <coughs> praise the bad ones, especially in, 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 uh, in the suburbs of uh, big cities. And uh, so it has nothing to do with uh, Eastern countries. But I think when you've been uh, colonized for uh, half a century by the foreign power, when you have uh, suffered a lack of freedom, you know, you, you tend to grasp your own destiny to, to your hands. And uh, unfortunately, the Western countries have been so spoiled by uh, history and, and, and wealth that now we are p we're paying it a, a very hard price. But maybe, as Thomas said, the, the, the salvation will come from the East, Eastern countries, Eastern European countries, and more Far Eastern uh, nations. I don't know if I answered your question properly, but uh, but I think uh, education is now one of the core problems in in Western Europe, especially in France. So it's a fall in, in, in the results, which is appalling, and which should be contained if we don't want to 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 disintegrate into a nation of ignorance. You know, people can, you know, for instance, in the baccalaureate, which is uh, uh, the exam, uh, you have 40% of the pupils who cannot properly write down their names, you know, who will, will, will misspell every word. And this is quite uh, terrifying. And of course, the, the educational budget is decreasing also, because we're broke. I think the main difference between Norway and France you're rich, we're broke. We used to be rich, we're not anymore. And so you're going to become the ideal country for many French people. Oh. And then we will be the new wave of migrants to invade your new city. In terms of uh, cohabitations, the French might be worse than the Muslims. <laughs> this is very good news for the Norwegian kitchen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Now we'll take the last question from Lars. Thank you. <clears throat> I must say that I object quite strongly to uh, Mr. Bruckner's uh, defense of the French model. I think that's a form of authoritarian liberalism that, uh, and, and it says a lot that laicite was adapted by the semi-fascist ideology of Kemal Atatürk. And we're not talking about secularism in the sense that the state separates itself from religion. We're talking about secularism in the sense that the state controls religion. The state controls religion in France. <coughs> in France. It's not separated from it. It controls it through the laws. It controls it by owning the churches and the synagogues. And since those are old institutions, they lend them back to the Christians, Catholics and Protestants and the Jews. But since the Muslims are fairly new, they don't have any institutions. So if we are going to talk about equal treatment, even though it's going to be a controlled treatment, then new religions have a lot to demand from the states. The French operate with a, a list of dangerous sects, which leads to discrimination. This is a lot of fairly innocent organizations are on these lists, and they are discriminated against. They are, in a sense, persecuted by central and local authorities. 
this is not a model for the future of a plural, pluralist society. You cannot force people to be free. <coughs> if you have a tradition that says, wear the hijab, people will wear the hijab. And who are you to say that, no, I'm going to teach you to be free? This is a paternalism that I've seen in a couple of articles and interviews that you object strongly to. But you are yourself represented this kind of paternalism. This is what I object to in the French model. Are other models better? Well, I'm not so sure. That's why we have challenges in Europe, in the West, globally actually, we do have these challenges. A comment to the friend who from Honglia. Yes, there are problems. But how are these problems manifesting themselves? Do you need to talk to these women who doesn't want to talk to men? You feel the urge to do so, and you want to be inclusive, you want to communicate with them. But maybe we should be patient and realize the simple fact of all social signs that social change takes time. That's why you cannot force it. And this is why what both of you have said, the second generation is quite different from the first generation. There is hope. And, and this is where I have to agree with Mr. Bergman, we should not compromise on the principles. There is no need to say that, well, we are going to transform the schools in Holmlia because there are a lot of Muslims there. We stick to our principles because we believe they are right. But when you confront a problem, then you try to find a solution to that problem. And usually, the solution to the problem is not force. It is not to force girls in France to take off the hijab. Why should you? <coughs> the French don't separate between the public institutions and the public sphere. You can rightly say a judge should not wear the hijab, but why shouldn't a pupil wear hijab? Why shouldn't people be able to walk dressed like they, whatever they want to wear on Champs-Élysées? What's the problem in that? The public square is a sphere, is a room for liberty, for human liberty. And we are not to define the liberty for others. Well, in fact, everybody is allowed to to walk with a hijab in France, in public sphere, except at school and public administration. This is the only limits of the law. So uh, France is not a, a country run by an omnipotent state which decides uh, how we have to dress or not, and in, in, in which concerns uh, laicity, I think, and I will object to your objection, that uh, it's one of the best systems to ensure the peaceful coexistence of religions uh, in, a, in, a in a country which has been, for so many centuries, the siege of uh, deep hatred between Protestants and Catholics. And uh, whatever judgment we have on Ataturk, uh, it was the first Muslim country to try to uh, divide the state from the religion, it has worked not so bad in a way, it's still uh, problematic today, but after all Turkey is for many Muslims a model of uh, sex successful integration uh, between a civil society and a religion, so it, it's not such a bad society. Um, so yes, you, you, you ask us to be patient, but Unfortunately, we have only one life, you know. And uh, for the young generations, uh, patience is not an option. Uh, especially for, uh, for instance, take, I will just give you one example. Uh, I, I'm teaching in France in a political institute, and I had <coughs> a student uh, coming from the suburbs. She was a, a young girl of 20, and she had two costumes, one for the suburbs and one for Paris. So she changed herself into uh, the toilets of the of the train, and in Paris she was, you know, in, in, in casual dress with jeans and shirt. And as soon as she she had to return home, she she put a hijab and and the dress. And she as she told us, if I don't wear the hijab, I would be treated as a whore. I would be uh, insulted and maybe attacked by the, the guys in my uh, in my uh, city. And so what can you do in, in, in this situation? Of course, uh, you can do much, 
but uh, you also have to take into consideration the aspiration of those young generation which want to succeed, which are Muslims by faith, which respect their own parents and tradition, but which don't want to be forced into uh, some things they consider a little archaic. So, wh what can we do in democratic societies? You said there are principles on which we cannot compromise. Yes, those principles are extremely simple. Equality between man and woman, no excision imposed on uh, young girls, uh, no forced marriages, which is one of the most scandalous things in, in, in uh, those societies, and uh, free permission for girls to go to schools and to go to <coughs> universities if they have the aptitude to do it. And uh, this should be the common basis. After, uh, after that, we can discuss the differences between the Anglo-Saxon model, which you have here, and the French yes. one. Yes. And we both have, uh, they both have <coughs> qualities, and they both have flaws. But uh, on those common grounds, there should be no discussion possible. And when you go, when you migrate to society, if you, tomorrow you, you go live in the States, or if you go to live, to, you go live in uh, to South Africa, you will have to respect the ways and manners of those people. You cannot act as if you were just transplanted into a, another society and you will keep exactly the same ways of life as you had in your former society. If I settle in Oslo tomorrow, I will have to respect you know, some aspect of your, of your traditions also. I will, I, I will not be able to behave as a Frenchman. You know, see what happened with DSK recently. Yes. So that's something yes. I will not be able to do. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 He thought he was still in France. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. if I do that, he will ask me to, to go back to my country. So, you know, uh, so we should uh, at the same time have a tradition of uh, hospitality and interest towards other cultures. Because after all, those, those uh, foreign cultures are extremely interesting. But as, at the same time, we have, uh, we have principles. And we will not uh, compromise on those on those ideals. Yes, this is frightening. I find myself in agreement with almost everything you say. <laughs> so we have to take we have to take another round and get much more disagreement next time.